Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm, I'm Marcy Bowers, MD. I'm a, a gynecologist with 27 years of experience. I work in the San Francisco Bay Area in a community uh, called Burlingham, California. I can be reached at our website, marcybowers.com, or through the organization I work with, clitoraid.org. And uh, uh, the director there is Nadine Gary. Uh, we're, we, we welcome anyone that has questions or uh, is further interested in, in the services we provide. And we are also interested in training as many providers as possible, surgeons who can help uh, uh, offer this meaningful service. FGM is uh, otherwise known as female genital cutting, um, excision. Uh, another name is uh, female circumcision, but I think I think that that gives the wrong message that it is anything analogous to male circumcision. Uh, female genital mutilation or FGM is really ritual cutting of the clitoris and or labia and or other ritual um, uh, violations of female genitalia that um, has no medical benefit. It differs from male circumcision because male circumcision is about just removing the foreskin and female genital mutilate, that does not leave the male sexually impaired and may actually have some mild, very, very mild medical benefit. Female genital mutilation has no medical benefit. In fact, it leaves um, women at risk of urinary tract infections, obstructed labors, um, uh, ruptures into the bladder and rectum during labor, um, inclusion cysts, um, blocked menstrual flow, uh, et cetera, et cetera, plus pain with intercourse and virtually no feeling with, with uh, sexual contact. So the, the effects for, for women are far more devastating and, uh, and of absolutely no be medical benefit. Male circumcision also does not involve um, removing the head of the penis or it remove it as opposed where FGM can actually include removing portions of the clitoris. Well, as you may or may not know, I was approached by Nadine Gary, who is, uh, remains the, uh, the clinical director of uh, an organization called Clitoraid. And uh, Clitoraid was formed to help women who had been genitally mutilated and in um, offering assistance in restoring a sense of feeling in the clitoral area and the ability to experience pleasure. She contacted me uh, in 2006, and uh, then in early 2007, I went and uh, studied with Pierre Foldis, who was the father of the surgical procedure to restore clitoral function. I, I actually had no hesitation. I'm an OBGYN with many years of experience, and I also had experience working with the transgender population in reconstructing genitalia. And what I came to realize is that, um, is that most of the women seeking clitoral restoration after FGM, and you can say FGM slash genital cutting if, you, if you'd like, um, uh, only because uh, we're trying to take the we're trying to take the judgmental aspects of, of uh, its description by calling it um, FGM, um, and, and that's a complicated side question that, you know, but for practical purposes, we're going to be calling it FGM. But uh, I, I had no hesitation in, in uh, accepting Nadine's offer. As it turns out, she had had 20-some OPGYNs across the United States previously turn her down to learn this work, which was came as a great surprise to me. Uh, I didn't let it bruise my ego any way, any, uh, but again, my work fit perfectly with it because I'd worked not only in, in women's health care and gynecologic care, 
for 20 some years, but I'd also uh, worked in the field of transgender medicine, where there too, patients are seeking uh, a, a, um, a restoration or an altering of their identity. And as it turns out, the women who experienced FGM and wanted clitoral restoration, they too had felt that their identity had been taken away from them. Even more than the ability to experience sexual pleasure, that that sense of loss of not having a part of their body was what they were seeking to regain. Well, there there is psychological aspect because the when you meet these when you meet, meet these women, they're of course they're as varied as the continent of Africa, but they're also uh, uh, they also have they have personal stories that actually have a lot of commonality amongst them, and uh, it it is hard because you they feel a sense of betrayal and there's anger and there's disappointment. And uh, um, most of the women uh, that I've talked to have had greatly compromised uh, intimate relationships with other, with other people, um, husbands and spouses. And it's actually led to infidelity, whereas the promise of FGM is that it's going to make you more suitable for marriage. In fact, just the opposite happens. And so when a person can't respond sexually, it's it's very frustrating to both partners, and uh, and so um, there's just a, a sense of, of of great frustration and embarrassment and shame and anger and betrayal. After all, it's the it, ironically it's the women of the villages in Africa who are the cutters, and uh, so um, they themselves having been cut. And so there's been this perpetuation of a lot of these lies and mythology about it. Uh, and those reasons are also complicated, but it it, it just um, it, somewhere the cycle has the, the the cycle has to end, and I think we're approaching that point actually. It, it's estimated that there is many as somewhere between two and five hundred thousand women in the United States who have been um, genitally cut, which is a fairly staggering number. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's quite as high as 500,000, but that is the potential number, apparently. These are primarily women who have either, um, who are of uh, generally African um, descent, who either had their, um, their cutting uh, while living as children in Africa and then immigrated to the U.S. Uh, but it's also common in other areas like, uh, like Indonesia and uh, uh, even parts of India, as you mentioned. So, uh, but but these women now having mig migrated to the U.S. Uh, are living here with this problem. Uh, but but uh, as they uh, adopt Western ways, they realize that this isn't a situation that has to remain static, and they don't have to suffer in silence uh, with this problem. So there's a potential great number of people that that could benefit from from uh, clitoral restoration. All types type one, two, three, yes. Four is, is pricking. It's sort of um, awkwardly named. Uh, if I have my way someday, I'm gonna make type four actually be type zero or type one rather, because it, it gives the, the message that it may be more severe, but actually it's just the act of pricking or nicking or, or, or um, not actually damaging uh, the the clitoris or the labia, but anyway, the yes, yeah, so all four types can be uh, restored. In fact, uh, we really when they're the more severe, which is actually the, the type three, the, the more severe the form, the the more likely there is going to be a very positive impact on somebody's life by restoration. We uh, offer this as at the age of consent, which is age 18. Um, but our patients that have come have had their um, have had have suffered their FGM as early as six months of age, and uh, we've operated on patients as old as 62. 
I actually have not. Um, I, you know, it is outlawed in the United States, of course, as it is though in most Western or most uh, African nations, including the most recent being Nigeria, that was uh, the largest African country um, uh, two years ago outlawed it. But that doesn't stop genital cutting, and uh, we do we do have a fear that it is doing uh, is still being done privately in the United States. Um, but I, I don't think it's it's terribly common. I'd like to think. Now, I have not seen a patient step forward wanting restoration after that here. But where we do see a large number of patients uh, from the United States are relatives of um, who, um, you know, their their grandchildren of African immigrants, and uh, and they go back home to visit relatives like an aunt or a grandmother, and then they're cut while in Africa, and uh, that is. Uh, that is tragic. That that um, uh, and that actually is one of the more uh, some of the more recent legislation is that it's now a crime to um, to willingly allow your child to go back to Africa where where cutting could occur. So parents need to think about that when they send their young girls back. Uh, in many cases, it is now covered by insurance if it's submitted. Um, we have. Uh, taken the lead of Dr. Foldis and do not charge for our services for doing the, the operation. And we just ask that patients pay for their um, transportation and their the operating room costs, which are fairly insignificant, less than about uh, $1,600, I believe. And uh, so it's fairly nominal in cost. And we just, we recognize this as a crime against humanity in the sense of um, as again, as described by Dr. Foldis, and so we've chosen to make this something that has no monetary value for providers of the care. Yeah, um, yeah, the, but the, the total process can take some time because I'm busy surgically, uh, and so it can take as much as a year for scheduling. Once uh, either our office is contacted directly, or um, or Nadine Gary at clitoraid.org. Um, CLI, well, it's clitoraid.org, and we could give that an address to you if you'd like. You can also just spell it out, but if you look it up, you know, if you search it, it certainly comes up. It's also, our, our name tends to come up also if you do any sort of um, FGM search on the internet. So the physical recovery is, of course, much shorter than the psychological recovery. And um, and then you lay on top of that the, the sexual aspects, which, you know, everyone that's so personal for people. Um, it, you know, um, the orgasm, of course, is in the brain. And so getting a person back to the point where they're actually at that end point, it's probably not a fair way to judge the success of, of uh, uh, clitoroplasty or clitoral restoration. Uh, the, the first and foremost thing that it really does is it offers hope to people. Um, who feel like they've had, again, part of their identity stolen, they've had relationship, relationships ruined, or they're fearful of future relationships just because they're ashamed of their body or they feel like something isn't right. And uh, so, um, so that hope is enormous in, in healing psychologically. But there's also an element of, of, um, of uh, post-traumatic stress for these patients. And they feel like, you know, you know, imagine at age three or four or six or even 12 or 13 held down by people you would love who are celebrating a bit of a party, you know, you know, thinking it's a coming of age party. And then um, and then you have this, you know, excruciating pain and and blood. And then, you know, um, and of course, some of these girls die even um, uh, during this procedure. Uh, it, that you know that's being perpetrated by women that have been trusted in the community so it's very you know it it's it's a great trauma uh, and and the memories that come out from the girls describing this is, are quite vivid they just don't forget so when you when you then you know when you then assign even if you restore clitorals you um, there probably have been years of of feeling pain with any sexual contact and very little pleasure. 
And so it's very, it's, it's hard to, to overcome that. Um, we are, unfortunately are not able to provide the, the sexual and um, psychiatric help that is an adjunct to this. And so unfortunately we, we, we rely on local resources where patients go back to their local communities and, and may choose to access this. But it, it's just, it's a very long educational process. Um, there, there's a gap in, in knowledge about anatomy sometimes for these patients. There's an, certainly a, the, the, the sexual physiology, sometimes that information is lacking. We turn over resources, we recommend vibrators, we, you know, uh, communication with a partner. Um, but uh, some self-exploration and self-actualization is really what probably is what drives most of the real success that comes from the, the restorative operations. The biggest challenge is, is that I, I can't provide enough services quickly enough, I feel like. Um, and, and the secondary aspect where I just, I can't be there to get them all the way through recovery. I, I just wish I could, I wish I could, um, to be there somehow, uh, and, and to, to answer questions and to, to encourage and, and, uh, help in, in, uh, in making it all possible again. Uh, that's probably the biggest issue. There's also uh, a lot of fear about coming forward. Uh, and you know, so many patients who could benefit are not coming forward because they, 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 you know, they don't, they, they've kind of taken this on and just assume there's nothing that could be done. There's, there's skepticism about the procedure, um, by, by others. Um, others are just uh, fearful that, that the original intent will be violated and that somehow their family would be harmed back in Africa. Um, so there's just a, and there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of obstacles to overcome, um, to get people to, to willingly accept this as a, as a bona fide medical procedure that uh, has, um, uh, true merit. It w I think it will though come. People will see that they, you know, it just, it is, uh, Dr. Foldis has done work to, to show that the, the effects are profound for many and that the, the sense of, of um, improvement is great. But, you know, we can only follow up with about a third of patients because they, they just, you know, they disappear into their own lives and uh, many are not really willing to talk about this. So getting the kind of scientific rigor that, so, that some have advocated in order to endorse the procedure, it, it's sort of foolish. You know, they just, they want the academic cart in front of the practical in um horse if you will <laughs> and and the fact is is that it the, the surgery does work the clitoris is always there 100 percent of the time and uh you know the the procedure has validity i i think just people talking about the clitoris <laughs> is a big step forward um giving some uh measure of credibility to to female sexuality and recognizing that it is important. And uh, I have uh, advocated for, um, for sexual senses being one of the six base, basic senses. And that instead of just looking as our, of, at our human experience as having just five basic sense, senses, I feel that the sexual sense is another sense. And so if you put it along the lines of, of uh, taste or sight or smell, which it's true, we don't need those, but they sure make life a lot better. Uh, I think that the sexual sense, too, is, is one of those things that enriches life. And uh, if there was a surgery that you could, you know, where you could restore sight to a blind man or the sense of smell to someone for the first time, I think, wouldn't, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, uh, you know, we'd be all standing up and, and shouting and, and singing for joy which is, I think, what we should do with the fact that there is a surgery that gives these patients hope. Yeah, this is, um, yes, I've heard about it. Um, I don't have the resources to fight it through the legal system, but I'm, I'm appalled that it's 
you know, put on the same, um, put in the same sense where it would legitimize this procedure. Um, it's, it has no medical benefit at all, and that differs from male circumcision. Um, however, I have become an, an opponent of, of male circumcision over time, and the, the issue for both of these procedures is the issue of, of consent. Now, it's one thing if a, if a woman says, I'm of age and I can consent to having an, an operation that leaves me without sexual feeling, with greater risk of urinary tract infections, inclusion cysts, obstructed labor, um, loss of relationships, um, infidelity, all the, all the unintended consequences of FGM. If they want to consent to that with a fully informed decision, then they can do so at an adult age. But to do this to a child, I think uh, that, is, that is unpardonable. And, uh, and, and I have come to the point where I no longer uh, endorse male circumcision under any circumstances either, uh, uh, other than for the one rare medical condition called phimosis, where the, the foreskin narrows and that needs to be cut back. But other than that one exception, it, the issue is consent for the child. And if, unless the child's able to fully consent, uh, I don't think you know anything can be medicalized, and uh, I don't think FGM should ever be medicalized. <laughs>